So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the symposium today. I'd like to start by recognizing uh, the land that we are on today. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories on which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of this institution. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tekaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Windat. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples, including the Inuit and Métis. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. This land acknowledgement is the beginning of responsibilities incumbent upon York University administrators, faculty, and students, including within the university. The Center for Feminist Research Indigenous Women Speaker Series, now in its third year, is part of this responsibility of making space in the academy for Indigenous women and Indigenous feminist voices. The Center for Feminist Research is therefore pleased to co-organize today's talk following the inaugural uh, CFR lecture with the Cree-speaking Métis feminist and poet, Emma Rock, and the second lecture with professors Deborah McGregor, Karen Ricolet, and Cheryl Suzak. My name is Elaine Coburn. I'm a non-Indigenous professor at York University with the Center for Feminist Research, and I am pleased to introduce my co-organizer for this event, Professor Sean Hillier, who is a Mi'kmaq scholar in the School of Health Policy Management and the special advisor to the Dean of Health on Indigenous Resurgence. So this lecture series marks a very important and historic moment for the School of Health Policy and Management, the Faculty of Health, and York University as an institution. In its demonstration of the commitment to coming together with prominent Indigenous scholars to listen and to learn and begin the process of understanding the impacts of colonization on the spaces and places in which we study, live, and work. We would like to thank the co-sponsors for this event, the Center for Feminist Research and the Faculty of Health, as well as the Department of Equity Studies, the Faculty of Environmental Studies, Office of the Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, the Graduate Program in Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, the Graduate Program in Social and Political Thought, York Indigeneity and Teaching and Learning Fund, the Office of the Vice Provost Academic, the Glendon Indigenous Affairs Council, and also to Julie Piraskina, who's done a lot of work as the coordinator for the CFR in making this event possible. The format for today's lecture uh, will, by Professor Joyce Green, is about 45 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers from the audience. Today's talk is entitled, Enabling Recon Reconciliation or Enabling Colonialism, Transforming in Conditions of Colonization of Colonialism and Ecological Crisis. Dr. Joyce Green is a professor of political science at the University of Regina. She has taught in the fields of Canadian politics, women in politics, and native studies. Her research interests have focused on issues of decolonization in Canada and of democracy in Canada. Most recently, she has been preoccupied with a project of indigenizing the university and with reconciliation problematics. Her published work has dealt with indigenous state relations, indigenous feminism, citizenship, identity, and racism in Canada's political culture, indigenous human rights, and with the reconciliation in Canada. She is the editor of Making Space for Indigenous Feminism and of Indivisibility. Uh, Indi I was like, I knew I was going to not say that right. Indigenous Human Rights. Dr. Green is of English, Tanaka, and Scottish English Métis descent, and her family experiences have provoked much of her scholarly, scholarly and political work. She currently lives in Cranbrook, BC, in Tanaka Territory. In the second edition of her book, Making Space for Indigenous Feminism, Professor Green writes, Indigenous feminists raise issues ranging from colonialism, racism and sexism, sexuality, environmental integrity, community integrity and infrastructure, to identity, violence against women and children, constitutional and institutional change and political liberation. Indigenous feminists illuminate issues that, but for their voices, would not be raised at all. This could not be more true of Professor Green's own truth-telling. So please join us in welcoming Professor Joyce Green. <laughs> 
so cute, kid. I find that now that I'm older, I forget what I'm doing, so I brought my notes. And it'll be 45 minutes, or maybe it'll be 55 minutes. It's going to be whatever, whatever it is now. I'm happy to be here. I'm a guest from Amakas Tunaka, also known as Kootenai Territory or Tunaka Territory. It is the unceded traditional territory of the Tunaka Nation, otherwise known as the East and West Kootenai in southeastern British Columbia. I want to acknowledge the solidarity and the support and the generosity of the Center for Feminist Research for this, the third annual Indigenous Women's Speakers Series, and especially the kind assistance of Elaine and Julie. And I want to preface my comments by putting my mic back on. Can you guys hear me OK? By saying that my words are not intended to offend or to injure anybody. But when you're talking about, about critical uh, analysis and about a reflection on power relations, it quite often happens that you do offend people. In the event you're offended, I invite you to reflect on why that is, on, on what assumptions are being challenged, what relationships are being impugned, and then perhaps we can proceed from there. I sustained a back injury when I moved to Edmonton to do my PhD on December 31st of 1993. It is forever emblazoned in my mind. I was lifting an Oak Entertainment sister, uh, system with a friend. And it was in those days that I knew I was immortal until I wasn't. The damage to my back was undiagnosed for some years. And then in 2008, I had surgery for the matter. It wasn't a silver bullet. And in 2012, I went on long-term disability leave from my position at the University of Regina. I remain on LTD now. It is a blessing. My husband and I moved back to the East Kootenai, where I was raised. The Cranbrook area is Akiskakliet, which means in Tunaka, a place where two creeks meet. I look out my window at Akinmi, a mountain with an ancient Tunaka story explaining its origins. But the settler community calls it Mount Baker, after an Englishman who obtained thousands of hectares of stolen Tunaka territory and who has been venerated ever since, with streets, businesses, and high schools named for him. The practice of naming is imbued with the politics of domination. This lecture is not a biography, but as feminist theory has taught us, the personal is political. My personal context led to my scholarly focus and my political preoccupations. And I share that with you so you have some idea of what contributed to my intellectual and political formation. My great, great, great grandfather, David, was Nasukan, a chief in the old ways of selecting leaders, which involves long apprenticeship from childhood, sacrifice, and service rather than prestige. His community was in the Tobacco Plains area of southeastern BC and northern Montana. He was a leader and warrior of the Tunaka Nation, whose traditional territory extends from the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains to the western shores of the Kootenai and the Arrow Lakes, up northeast of Revelstoke to the Big Bend of the Columbia River, and south past the Medicine Line into northern Montana and Idaho. In 1887, David's community was visited by one major, Peter O'Reilly, superintendent of Indian Reserves for the province of British Columbia. By way of translators, David asked O'Reilly why he had come to see him. The historical record tells us that O'Reilly answered, I have come because the Queen has sent me so you Indians can select land. David replied, you come and ask me to pick some of my own lands for me to live on? How can you give me my lands that I have always held? How are they yours to give? O'Reilly said, good, choose your lands. 
David replied, I will tell you what land I want for the Indians. I want all the country from the coast in the far south to the Arctic in the north and from the Atlantic on the east to the Pacific on the west. O'Reilly, don't talk like a child. Talk sensible and choose your land. David, why do you object? You are sent by the queen to hear what I wanted. Well, I will tell you. And he described the area of Amakastunaka, all the land inside these boundary lines. O'Reilly said, we cannot talk about United States land. It is on the other side of the boundary. And David said, what is the meaning of this boundary line? It runs through the middle of my house. My home is on both sides. Why should you, without asking me or considering me, divide my property in two and also divide my children? There was more discussion similarly unproductive, and O'Reilly continued to deny David's land claim. David continued to insist on a Makastunaka. He said, this is what I want, and this is my last word. I will take the Queen's word that we will have reserved for us what we ask. O'Reilly then pulled out his watch and said, it is near noon. We will close this meeting. Tomorrow at noon, we will convene again. But when David and the Tunaka de delegation assembled the next day, they found that O'Reilly had packed up and left. David believed the reserve question was settled and that the last word he had said was accepted as final. When he learned of the limits of the Tobacco Plains Reserve, a pocket handkerchief-sized chunk of mediocre land. He said, I did not expect this. It is the same as if a thief had stolen from inside my house. The reserve here has been made so small for me that I can only live on it in starvation and destitution. And so it was. After the reserve was settled, Michael Phillips was appointed Indian agent my great-great-grandfather, who married Rowena, one of David's daughters. David's advisors record that Phillips told us that the queen had ordered all this to be done, but we think the queen did not know how our lands had been stolen. We were asked to point out what we wanted, and our chief did this, but we never got it. The whites have become possessors of our lands and have waxed prosperous on them. Thus, our lands have been stolen. This account is similar to many across Turtle Island. Colonialism adapts to each era, but keeps its motivations and its mechanisms. It is what Gina Starblanket calls an ongoing structure and not a historical event. Fundamentally, the issues are still land, resources, jurisdiction, sovereignty, and genocide. The justification is found in racist ideology, theology, and views of development that, well, we teach in political science. These days, the solution is called reconciliation. I will unpack that later. Here, I draw your attention to the unbroken line from my great-great-great-grandfather's experience to contemporary struggles for a measure of sovereignty and autonomy on Tunaka lands. This presentation identifies that line, identifies the motivations and the costs, and urgently calls for an approach that would be reconciliatory, but is not cost-free, that of returning a measure of our stolen land, appropriated jurisdiction and sovereignty, and making constitutional room for a third federal order to accommodate indigenous governments within Canadian federalism. In my view, nothing else will be reconciliatory, even if it is positive policy on human rights and equity issues. Not all will agree with me that my objective is liberatory, but I think it secures much of what indigenous intellectuals and activists want in the conditions that we have, and I have never subscribed to the boat argument. Are you all familiar with the boat argument? Seeing nobody protesting, I'll go on. I'll be discussing colonialism and its gendered impacts, genocide, reconciliation, and its problematic, and I also raise the specter of ecocide. 
the past and continuing motivations for land theft and economic development are a major part of the incentives which have produced our current dystopian climate catastrophe and that impact Indigenous peoples particularly hard. For example, in the last few years, I've seen the extirpation of the mountain caribou from the lower Purcell Mountains in my home territory. This is an iconic species that used to be so no numerous that oral history documents the occasional taking of hundreds of animals by Kinaka. Several years ago, I saw a single caribou standing on the summit of Kootenai Pass. Last year, all but one of the last animals was captured and moved to pens north of Revelstoke. Their scourge has been the human-imposed loss of habitat due to roads, trails, utility lines, and off-road recreation in the backcountry. These many access points have accelerated predation on the caribou and disruption from backcountry recreation and hunting as well as interfered with their, their historic migration routes. There is now one lonely, iconic caribou who escaped capture in the Purcell Mountains. While the subject of climate change may seem out of place in the context of the rest of the presentation, I am convinced that, in fact, it is implicit and central to the other themes I raise here. Drawing on indigenous thought and stepping away from colonial power and privilege will produce not only conditions for reconciliation, but also the conditions for a better human relationship with our ecological terrain. Because this is of necessity a wide-ranging discussion across history, geography, political movements, and philosophical, economic, legal, and ideological frameworks, I will take up my propositions thematically and hope that you will see the interrelationships among them. I explore the continuity of the land theft matter, beginning with the account of that first theft in Amakstunaka. I raise the ecological wisdom of indigenous thought, which is most useful for consideration in relation to our current planet-wide climate crisis. I discuss the elements of colonialism and genocide, the challenge of reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and Canada, and some of the more blatant contradictions between what government says and what government does. I note that Indigenous women have been particularly impacted by racist oppression fused with patriarchal impulses. I conclude that the original dispossessions remain the primary deprivations enforced by the colonial order and that reconciliation fundamentally requires recognition and redress for those deprivations and the cascade of negative con consequences that affects us today. Liberalism and modernization the dominant and dominating political and academic paradigms of the past century and a half provided the logic for their dominance. They were considered the expression of the most advanced impulses in human civilization, and thus, resistance was not only futile, but it was irrational. The values within indigenous philosophical paradigms were considered unnecessary to the political and economic models and practices of global capitalist expansion. It is precisely this hegemonic theological and philosophical conception of human preeminence in creation, and consequently, the dominating exploitative logics of capitalism and Western rationality that have led humanity to the abyss of ecocide. Can indigenous conceptions of relationship responsibility and respect save the planet from this? It depends. If the powerful actors dominating our economies and our politics, along with the masses of citizens accustomed to the status quo, are willing to listen and act on them. But the wisdom is there. In other words, our success and our survival depends on the success of a transformational politics 
While I don't wish to essentialize or homogenize Indigenous thought, there are some broad commonalities that are typical of Indigenous philosophies, cosmologies, and social relations. Indigenous conceptions of relationship, respect, and responsibility frame land use and tenure regimes, political relations and protocols, and expectations of individuals in community. Conceptually predisposed to values of balance and harmony, these views are inconsistent with the liberal capitalist imperatives of male human domination of all for personal gain, and thus are not fertile grounds for capitalist economic relations. However, they contain wisdom and imply practices that may be essential if the ecosphere is to survive human consumption and exploitation. They are also essential components of a decolonization and ecologist program for the Canadian state. Indigenous political thought has approached the problematic of relationship as a multifaceted affair, an always in process that is essentially a verb. Thus, relationship is sustained through practices, ceremonies, and acts of meaning and recognition. The most fundamental relationship is between a people and its land characterized through relational practices which are framed by that cosmological value of respect. Land has important non-economic meaning, is a sacred geography, the location of spiritual practices tied to sacred sites, and human beings are a small part of a larger equal order. These are core values shared generally by indigenous peoples in Canada and North America, the area known as Turtle Island. Relationship is a perpetual process framed by that other dominant motif, respect. Respect for others' views and autonomy, for other creatures, for the biosphere, for the knowledge embodied in elders, and for particular practices commended by traditions is a condition for relationship. I note parenthetically that the settler state and its primarily white citizens have not treated indigenous peoples with respect, a fact demonstrated by the character of the relationship between them. As Star Blanket puts it, the most damaging attack of all has been on our ways of existing in all our relations and implicates the animals, birds, waterways, lands, ancestors, spirits, and creator as political actors. And relationship is practiced through a conception of personal and collective responsibility to each other, to the biosphere, and to a future in which one will not be present. Thus, government, economic agents, and individuals are understood to have responsibility to all facets of creation and across generations. The notion of thinking through decisions to their impacts on those seven generations removed from us is an expression of this political responsibility that extends far beyond electoral rotations and quarterly profit reports. Relationship is simultaneously practiced with all manifestations of creation and is framed by responsibilities rather than rights. It is more stewardship than ownership. Land is not the object of ownership, but part of the web of relationships structured by ceremonies. This is a cosmological view in which politics is integrated with spiritual, cultural, social, and other forms of national organization. The relationship between indigenous communities and their territories has the capacity to involve non-human, non-animate others who are also elements of creation. This is why, for example, the Tunaka Nation requires that Gutmuk, an area dominated by a glacier high in the Purcell Mountains, be left as it is for the grizzly bear spirit, despite the rejection of that claim by the Supreme Court of Canada that this is a manifestation of Tanaka religious rights protected by constitutional law. Nonsense, said the Springs. You can believe whatever you want, 
And so the, re, the uh, glacier may be developed by a developer as a year-round ski, re, ski resort on a vanishing glacier. And that, Tunaka understand, will um, evict the grizzly bear spirit. This kind of a relationship is a manifestation of a conceptual system that places particular human beings in relation to everything in their territories, a particular part of the ecosphere, with a cosmological mandate to care for it so as to be cared for by it. On this view, humanity is no more and no less important than any other aspect of creation. The political economies and ecological concepts that emerge from this view are imbued with the relational ethic of all to all. Now, in my notes, I went on honking about um, ecofeminism and how it has some consonance with indigenous philosophies. But then I figured you couldn't sit here for two hours. So I'm skipping over that. But if you're studying these things, it does make for some interesting reading. Moving on then to the notion of reconciliation, a term introduced into the Canadian political lexicon by the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015. According to the TRC, reconciliation requires awareness of the past, acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement for the causes, and action to change the behavior and requires real social, political, and economic change. So that's cited to 2015 to the TRC. Reconciliation is often understood as akin to the Christian theological conceptions of repentance, penance, and absolution. This understanding also focuses on the proposition of a final state of relational peace achieved in fairly quick order by an act of apology and contrition, and of course, a commitment to go forth and sin no more. Unfortunately, this view of reconciliation frames it as a one-time event which releases liabilities for the continuing effects of the matter for which reconciliation is to be obtained. The formula is transactional in its character. The term has become ubiquitous and is deployed to frame initiatives that run the gamut from participation in resource infrastructure to partisan descriptions of their policy objectives, to settler and indigenous descriptions of their legal and other projects. Mostly, it is used out of context and without consideration of the heavy responsibilities that are fused to the objective. At worst, it is deployed deceptively to sanitize initiatives that are, in fact, colonial and oppressive in their conception and in their deployment. Because the Liberals have most recently been in power, and are again in power, and because Justin Trudeau made much of his commitment to the reconciliatory relationship with Indigenous peoples, I'll be commenting on the Liberal record. But that's because he's in government. A minor historical excavation of the record of the Harper years shows far worse treatment without the reconciliatory gloss and every Canadian government back to Confederation is thoroughly implicated in oppression of Indigenous people and violation of Indigenous human rights through the expansion of the Canadian state. There is enough evidence of consistent colonial oppression to carry the blame around across parties. The 2015 election of the Trudeau Liberals was accompanied by some very promising rhetoric regarding Indigenous peoples and reconciliation. The Liberal leader repeatedly, repeatedly said that no relationship was more important to him and his government than that with Indigenous people, a phrase he continues to deploy this time around. He invited Jody Wilson-Raybould to join his cabinet and become the first Indigenous Minister of Justice and Attorney General. He raised expectations in Indian country that a number of virtually permanent Indigenous human rights violations would be remedied. The new and now former Minister of Justice directed her department to stop routinely appealing Indigenous favorable court decisions on behalf of government. Note that the Trudeau Liberals have stepped back from this following their last election and are now appealing an order of the federal court 
in the matter of the finding of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal that the government of Canada systematically underfunded Indigenous children's education and child welfare services so significantly that the judge imposed a $40,000 penalty to be paid by government to each affected child and immediate family members. But they're appealing that. By way of comparison, in March 2019, the same government awarded 40 million bucks to Evraz, a profitable steel maker in Regina, and not coincidentally within the riding of the now de-elected Ralph Goodale, which also makes pipes for pipelines. The money was for them to have new furnace upgrades. Government spent a significant, if insufficient, sum of money to improve the third world living conditions in a number of First Nations communities, particularly for clean water. This was inaccurately called reconciliation, although it is merely securing adequate services in the Canadian context. It is possible to be colonized and have clean water. The Prime Minister, with his then Minister of Indigenous Crown Relations, undertook an extensive review of federal laws and policies concerning Indigenous peoples called the Recognition of Rights Framework. And the Prime Minister apologized for a number of historical wrongs done to Indigenous peoples, including the wrongful 1885 criminal conviction and incarceration of Cree Chief Poundmaker events which led to his premature death. All of these measures were intended to secure reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. They have not done so because contemporary forms of assimilation and colonial appropriation of land continue. The 2019 exoneration of Poundmaker is consistent with the federal government's general orientation to reconciliation. That is, the recognition of select historical errors and a commitment to a renewed relationship. Yet absent from these occasions is any recognition of the systemic factors that continue to give rise to relational wrongs and to genocidal policies. The Conservatives have never come close to the Liberals' positive record over the past four years. Their miserable record under the Harper governments speaks for itself. Despite Stephen Harper's heartfelt apology for the residential school matter, another genocidal policy, he was unable to recognize the systemic nature of racism, land theft, state oppression, and human rights violations of Indigenous peoples by Canada. And so 15 minutes after the apology, he was able to volunteer to the media that Canada is beloved because it has no history of colonialism. In that, he was no worse than every other prime minister before or since. Doing better than any previous federal government is a very low bar indeed. Every Canadian government has violated the rights of Indigenous peoples. This is the normal functioning of colonialism, now a self-perpetuating and evolving systemic process one that forms part of Canadian political culture and mythology. So let's take a close look at this colonialism, which depends on the theft of Indigenous lands, the usurpation of Indigenous sovereignties, the justification for this through racist, philosophical, legal, and theological myths, and also through the educational systems, including universities, maybe especially political science and the construction of a political culture and economic framework that erases Indigenous peoples' claims and particularities along with Canada's record of violence, theft, and racism. Subsequent to successful colonization, the task for Canada became the maintenance of settler dominance at the expense of the colonized, and this was done through bureaucratic, military, and ideological means. The consequence of colonialism was the divorce of indigenous peoples from their traditional territories and from the relational practices deployed by particular nations with their territories, 
And so a number of relational practices, such as Sundance and Potlatch and so on, were made illegal, were placed under the criminal code. Another consequence was the privatization and the monetization of land and the obliteration of indigenous non-monetized activity that depends on land. It resulted in other relational fracturing. Indigenous nations were split nation from nation, band by band by reserve, women from men, status Indians from Métis and from non-status people. Both the oppressive coerce of nature of the colonial indigenous relationship and the geographic and institutional segregation of communities ensured that indigenous peoples were relationally alienated from other indigenous people and from non-indigenous people, the beneficiaries of the colonial order. It was separation, not relationship. Particularly in communities governed by the Indian Act, women and men were treated differently and unequally. Heidi Stark writes that colonialism cannot be fully understood or separated from the gender violence that animates it. Mary Eberts asserts that the staggering amount of violence against Indigenous women is a product of colonialism. Indigenous women were and are mischaracterized as wild, disorderly, promiscuous, and dangerous. They often lose their children thanks to the interventions of the colonial state. They also frequently lose their health and their lives, as documented most recently by the 2019 Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's and Girls Inquiry. In Ebert's powerful words, they are constructed by the colonial state and its cultures as, and I quote, a population of prey. And they are then often preyed upon by the very state officials charged with protecting them. When indigenous women come to grief at the hands of settler men and the settler state, they are frequently blamed for being the agents of their own destruction. This contrasts with the colonial ideal of the good woman confined to her home, taking care of her kids and under the control of her most proximate patriarch and charged with the moral maintenance of her family and community. Powerless, but always in there for the good, eh? This ideal was imposed on indigenous women who were reframed as degraded persons, as squaws. The gendered experience of colonialism is dramatic and negative for both men and women, but is arguably most deleterious for women. Gendered violence is fundamental to framing white superiority and thus entitlement to the land. In Stark's words, Canadian colonial culture and institutions have largely produced the environment that renders this violence both permissible and lawful. To recap, colonization in Canada was motivated by the search for others' land and wealth, legitimated by the facilitative fictions of colonial ideology, and implemented by state policy through the army, the cops, the churches, and state bureaucrats. It is now a self-perpetuating, self-legitimizing set of structures, mythologies, and practices that continue the oppression of contemporary indigenous peoples for the benefit of the settler state. The long line of governments since Confederation ranged from overtly to passively hostile, assimilative, and neglectful of indigenous people. As these governments are obtained by democratic measures, no matter how weak our electoral system, the responsibility for the consequences of government decisions lies with all Canadians. Canada is a settler state conceived over and against Indigenous sovereignties. It was designed for settler populations and for really select ones. The uh, founding fathers preferred them to be white Northern Europeans. And thus, while most settler Canadians have never personally committed an act of explicit racism against an Indigenous person, they have benefited from the structures, 
and from the consequence of colonialism. This is what we call privilege, and it includes the comfort of not knowing about these things. Eroding this convenient collective amnesia means truth-telling heard broadly and responded to by citizens as well as by political elites. Because of the differential power relations consequent to this history and the politics implicit in a challenge to the status quo, there has been little appetite tight within that privileged cadre of citizens to grapple with this subject. Fundamentally, there is little consideration by settler Canadians of the architecture of colonialism, of the enabling conditions which produced and executed the impugned policy animating the residential schools and a host of other policy and legislative actions. While colonialism is too often framed as an historic matter, it continues unabated primarily in the form of resource extraction and related activities at the behest of and under the protection of the state, and without due regard for the fundamental right of free, prior, and informed consent, or FPIC, protected in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These violations affect Indigenous rights to land and resources, food security, environment and climate change, free trade, essential services, and children rights. To this, we must add the violation of indigenous women's rights perpetually in oversight in political theory and policy. In the process, Canada has consistently violated its obligations at domestic and international law. Contemporary Canadian colonialism includes the failure of the state to grapple with returning at least some measure of its stolen land to Indigenous nations. It includes the continuous bungling of legislative changes to the Indian Act membership provisions, which were only remedied in September 2019. And it includes the protracted and largely inept rollout of the Federal Task Force on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. It includes the Trudeau government's Orwellian entitled Recognition of Rights Framework of 2018, which both failed to recognize rights and was framed to limit them. You can't make this stuff up. It includes the stratospheric numbers of incarcerated Indigenous people and Indigenous children in state care more than at any time during the height of the residential schools. And it includes the statistically dramatic differences in life and health outcomes between settler Canadians and Indigenous peoples, and in the perpetual budgetary and policy indifference to these phenomena by Canada. If we now recognize Canada's policy approach to Indigenous peoples to have consisted of fundamental violations of human rights and of Indigenous title, then a renewed Indigenous state relationship requires more than an acknowledgement. It requires changes to configurations of power and jurisdiction, as well as to the underlying logics that reproduce them. There have been several important public inquiries into contemporary consequences of racism and colonialism. For example, the Manitoba Justice Inquiry, which reported in, I think, 1988 or 1990, Mary, correct me if I'm off on that, looked into the murders of Helen Betty Osborne in 1971 and of J.J. Harper in 1988. J.J. was arrested for fitting the description, and then he got uppity. Helen Betty would be about my age. I often think of her and wonder, would she have been a political science prof? but she was picked up walking home from school by four nice young white boys who savagely raped her and then killed her with a screwdriver. Two of these inquiries, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Reports, have used the term genocide to describe the effects of the policies and practices under consideration. The TRC wrote, and I quote, for over a century, the central goals of Canada's Aboriginal policy were to eliminate Aboriginal governments, 
ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools was a central element of this policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide. The missing and murdered report concluded that, and I quote, the significant, persistent, and deliberate pattern of systemic racial and gendered human rights and indigenous rights violations and abuses perpetuated historically and maintained today by the Canadian state designed to displace indigenous peoples from their land, social structures and governance, and to eradicate their existence as nations, communities, families and individuals is the cause of the disappearances, murders and violence experienced by indigenous women and girls. Genocide, as you know, occurs through the systematic eradication of the conditions for cultural and physical existence and need not be a single act or policy. Colonialism is genocidal within the definition at international law as it functions in Canada. All inquiries have made recommendations, the majority of which have not been enacted by Canadian governments. Yet the final report of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry says, and I quote, these recommendations, which we frame as calls for justice, are legal imperatives. They are not optional. The calls for justice arise from domestic and international human and Indigenous rights laws, including the Charter, the Constitution, and the Honour of the Crown. As such, Canada has a legal obligation to fully implement these calls for justice." Close quote. So what we can see is that the analysis tells us that the Canadian state is thoroughly implicated in the ongoing colonization and genocide of Indigenous peoples, and that despite our thoroughgoing consideration of manifestations of this policy, nothing is changing. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, chaired by Justice, now Senator Murray Sinclair, was struck to examine the impact of Canada's residential school policy on Indigenous peoples. The truth part was hearing from those affected, a large number as the schools operated across the country for over a century until as recently as 1996. The injuries are profound and intergenerational. The reconciliation part was to be found in the hearing of the truth, the state's remorse for the policy, its recognition of the injuries caused by the policy, monetary compensation, which of course is a symbol of recognition, and a commitment to a changed relational practice. But the residential schools issue cannot account for the rest of the genocidal harms inflicted on Indigenous peoples by Canada, and it does not account for the systemic and self-perpetuating nature of racism and colonialism, the one the ideology, the other the practice. Reconciliation is achieved by recognition, remorse, restitution, and relationship. Truth is a necessary but insufficient condition for reconciliation. Reconciliatory practices cannot be transactional, forgiveness in return for friendship, for positive policy, and so on. Reconciliation is possible if those who share responsibility for the wrongs reflect on and feel remorse for that, and then commit to making amends and make amends, and then forge a new relationship with those who have been wronged if that is welcomed by the victims. Reconciliation in the Canadian context requires changes in power relationships, in political institutions, and in specific and continuing actions, like that benighted recognition of rights framework, not simply by the telling of truth. As Jeremy Patzer notes, there is a problem of, I quote, 
promoting preemptive reconciliation while alighting underlying issues, the greatest of which is colonial dispossession and the struggle for decolonization and self-determination, close quote. It's the truth of that little land theft matter that needs recognition and restitution if reconciliation is to be meaningful for indigenous peoples. The recognition and implementation of indigenous rights framework is an example of the state perpetuating oppression while apologizing for it. It was presented as part of the federal government's commitment to reconciliation, but it was, according to the prime minister, intended to give new life to section 35 of the constitution. This not so emancipatory framework was designed to contain and limit indigenous rights, not recognize them. It guaranteed less than the status quo at Canadian law and international law. The draft effectively would have set the agenda, defined the parameters of discussion, and limited the range of indigenous critique to exclude the important matters of self-determination, land reparations, federal transformation to make jurisdictional space and tax room for a third order of government, and so on. We return to the land issue. Land, specific land, not just any land, is the heart of indigenous laws, governance, cultures, and relationships to which we hold both rights and responsibilities. It is the foundation of the colonial impulse and the ongoing source of wealth for Project Canada. It's the key to our identities, our pasts, and our futures. Indigenous nations are constituted by and have responsibilities to their territories. Strip the territory away and you tear the heart out of the nation as a self-replicating social organization. The land is fundamental to all Indigenous rights and to the oppression that has left Indigenous peoples impoverished, subordinated, and marginalized in Canada. And land is precisely what the federal and provincial governments want, but never want to talk about. That discussion would include jurisdiction, provincial and federal relationships with Indigenous governments, treaties, tax room, control of natural resources and revenue sharing. The ongoing failure to address the land question has brought us to the current impasse. By continually bracketing off the land question from the reconciliation agenda and promises of self-government, a term I loathe, the Trudeau government was able to simultaneous declare, uh, simultaneously declare that it is hard at work repairing the relationship with Indigenous peoples at the same time as it says the pipeline will be built despite the lack of Indigenous consent. The foundational myths of settlement inevitably frame progress as a process emerging from the settlement of wildness. It's the imposition of order over disorder, the virtues of colonial civilizations against the uncivilized state of indigenous peoples, and the religious justifications inherent in a muscular and xenophobic conception of Christianity. Several of these myths have been theorized and disseminated by prominent intellectuals, further implicating the academy and colonialism. These are the key elements to the process of colonization in Canada now, celebrated in cultural and political myths that unify settler populations, like Don Cherry, while alienating indigenous ones. Sorry, I just couldn't resist. The settler state has a most difficult time accepting responsibility for the actions of its governments and bureaucratic agents that violated the rights of indigenous peoples. And with acknowledging that the state itself is built on the expropriated base of indigenous territories, sovereignties, and resources. Reconciliation initiatives have been focused on past errors, not on the contemporary continuance of them and have been framed by what uh, philosopher Melissa Williams calls uh, 
the particular model of political economy, namely a capitalist one whose surplus depends heavily on resource extraction. Along with the federal government's failure to recognize and animate indigenous rights, it is hell-bent on continuing the Canadian tradition of appropriating indigenous lands and resources and ignoring indigenous descent. And thus, the logically contradictory objectives of reconciliation and pipeline construction without indigenous consent have been reiterated as government priorities for this round as well. And yet, while the forces that deliver colonialism and ecocide are formidable, so too are the nascent forces of opposition arising to contest power, and more importantly, to contest vision. Greta Thunberg and her many allies are speaking truth to power, and they represent both political power, particularly in the future, and they represent a shift in values. You will have noticed that Thunberg is generally supported by indigenous activists. You may also have noticed the alliances of anti-capitalist and ecological formations with those that are protesting ecocide. There is a different vision of the future without the capitalist order, and it offers a measure of hope to many who are hopeless. It is a vision that can and is drawing from indigenous knowledges and histories for its inspiration and for its aspirations. There is no Canadian government, government which has turned away from colonial assumptions and towards reconciliation, despite the occasional rhetoric of nation-to-nation -nation relationships and turning new pages. On the urgent issues of Indigenous rights, the Trudeau Liberals have behaved inconsistently with their professed commitment to a reconciliatory relationship, but consistently with the record of all previous governments on Indigenous rights. In sum, in matters of colonial pra practice, tout ça change, tout c'est la même chose. I think about my great, great, great grandfather's experience and the catastrophe that followed for the Tunica nation. The Canadian state's own laws, commissions of inquiry, and the international laws it has endorsed impose state obligations to redress land theft. If we have our land back, we have our context, and we can rebuild our nations. If Canada makes even a modest effort to recognize its history of theft and oppression and the fact that it is still going on, it may be able to establish a new foundation for relationship. And only then, with restitution and demonstrated changes to existing configurations of power and jurisdiction, may there be any possibility of writing the relationship. Thank you. You don't have to ask a question. You can just get up and make a statement. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sasha. Oh, that's okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your views and insights. I think we're all quite hungry for that. But um, I didn't get a chance to use my constraint to go on about climate change and climate justice. But using an indigenous lens, how can we go about dealing with the issues today of climate change activism and organization in relation to land, in relation to the things that are happening right now? Well, <clears throat> I think if we take as our prime directives the proposition that everything we have to do has to be in relationship with a specific territory, not with a general territory. That will limit our focus to where we live. In other words, it's probably fairly incompatible with the notion of uh, globalization. And then if we take the proposition that we are in relationship with everything, that we must be in balance with everything, that too places certain parameters on what we can do with and to the land. 
And so at this point, you're all thinking, yeah, like that's going to happen. Because of course, what it does mean is we are challenging the current global economic order, which has produced enormous wealth for some at the expense of many. But the some have a lot of power. I don't wish to sound hopeless, though, because I think what Thunberg is showing us is that one deeply convicted person who is willing to devote her life to a positive cause can have an impact. And these are young people. They're going to be around long after I've toddled off. So I do take a lot of hope from that. Very interesting. I was um, during my PhD. I pulled a bunch of freedom of information uh, requests about how the federal government funds uh, access to healthcare for Indigenous people on reserves or access to major youth services programming. And so, what, what we found was that the federal government, for the past eight years, has year over year steadily decreased funding into First Nations communities, into First Nation authorities uh, around uh, access to care, programming, uh, those types of things. And so they were decreasing while we see increasing numbers of infections in communities, which we now know to be an epidemic in the north. Um, and then what was very interesting is that this past year uh, at the International AIDS Conference is that we had the Minister of Health arrive and make large keynote speeches talking about how now they're now investing $45 million in uh, health care, uh, specifically geared towards uh, combating HIV in Indigenous communities. And that I stood up after and I talked about how this is the direct kind of form of modern-day colonization uh, and racism that takes place where a government can, you know, underfund, underfund, cut funding, and then all of a sudden stand up as an international audience and say, look, we're, we're doing so much, and, you know, and how this, you know, is being perpetrated uh, upon indigenous bodies over and over again. Yeah, thank you for that. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was very, definitely very important and very eloquent. Uh, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on land acknowledgements in general. I, because I often feel that it means nothing, but it has become something that is like, like something that you do so you seem woke and it's everywhere. And I was wondering what your thoughts are. I think a number of, of uh, Indigenous scholars and activists have talked about this because, yes, it can become fairly meaningless. You know, it's, it's like saying grace at dinner when you don't really mean it. Um, and, and so I think the best invocation of land is one that reminds people where they are, which means reminding them of whose land they're standing on. And then it could go on to remind them of why that matters. But if we don't get to the what matters, it's fairly meaningless. You know, we're on unceded Tanaka territory. Big deal. They're still on it. And, and so until we get to the point where they acknowledge that this land is unceded, which means that the settler population is squatted on our lands without our permission, you know, and that that means something, it probably is, uh, you say maybe they think they're woke, but they're only half woke. We have to get them the rest of the way woke. Yeah. As usual, I have found your um, thoughts um, provocative and energizing. And I also find myself uh, wanting to ask you uh, the answer to a question that I'm always torment myself with. And the question is one that I'm often asked when I go and speak places, and that is, um, as an individual, what can I do? And uh, I listen to you speak, and I think, well, one answer to, as an individual, what can I do, is um, just uh, train yourself to think like Joyce Green. <laughs> and then in uh, everything you do, vis-a-vis -vis your own government, your own educational system, your health system, and so on. Be a citizen or be a person, a consumer, or whatever, 
who uh, expects uh, the answers to the questions that Joyce Green would ask. So that basically we transform ourselves into advocates for true reconciliation. And uh, I'm not going to ask you if that's a good idea. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you, have, if you have any ideas about how we could do it. And that's because I think it is a good idea. We can't just do a little bit here and a little bit there from the standpoint of our uh, probably unrecognized uh, settler colonial uh, perspective. We have to change the way we think. So how do we change the way we think? And, and how do we make those changes so deeply imbued in ourselves that we will start acting uh, pursuant to that new uh, consciousness? You're going to sit down? I'm going to sit down, yes. <laughs> this woman has no lessons to learn from me. This is Mary Eberts, the great legal practitioner and scholar who has been one of my heroes for so many years. Um, and, and who has no lessons to learn from me on that. So the project of what can we as individuals do when we are enmeshed in economic and cultural orders where we live, it's, it's very difficult to destabilize these things. Um, I'd say the first is read. Read a book or two or ten about these matters to get a sense for the different positions and for the, the profound cascade of problems that has followed colonization. And remember, it's not historic, it's still happening. And then the second would be, since I believe that most people are compassionate and other regarding, look around you. As I used to tell my students when I would go into my primarily white classroom, where the hell are all the Indians? Well, yeah. You know, where, where the hell are all of the, all the Indians? Because why are, were my classrooms not filled with Indigenous students on Treaty 4 territory? And so they began to think about what were the kinds of filters that would keep those young people out of university so that they didn't have colleagues, so that they didn't have anyone to talk to about this. So look around you in this room and other rooms and, and ask yourself that question, where the hell are all the Indians? And remember that some of us don't really look the part, <laughs> so maybe they're there. But um, that can lead you to interrogating other practices of invitation and legitimacy by our institutions. And then the third can be imagining alternatives. So we have um, a, a very weak, form of democracy here that reproduces itself, as, as you may have noticed, so that the political ideology and the economic practice is fairly consistent between parties and over times, which maintains the motivation and the rewards for that close connection between corporate and political interests, so that the system doesn't get disabled much. Or you would have what Sam Huntington used to call, you know, the excess of democracy, where the rabble get active. Please be rabble. Please get active. And imagine alternatives, because the system that we have is taking us very quickly to ecocide or to planeticide, so that all of our lives will be transformed immediately, um, ineluctably, and negatively by this catastrophe caused by our overconsumption and by our exploitation with rather than relationship to the land. And I think that one will probably focus a lot of minds because nothing so much focuses the mind as the prospect of getting hung, drowned, or burned in the morning. And we know that two of those three are happening quite regularly. But as we imagine other alternatives, look around you for the allies and for the solidarities as Thunberg is, as indigenous activists are, so that we can find those who truly do want to imagine other ways of being that are not going to injure the earth or each other. And while I'm talking about colonization here, you must know that colonization has happened around the world, not always in the same ways, but always for the same reasons. 
And so colonization is deeply linked to capitalism and to human exploitation and to the eradication of countless species and the destruction of the land. As we begin to unpack that here, we will become more attuned to the way it is practiced elsewhere, and we will find that we are better allies with those who suffer now in conditions of exploitation elsewhere. In short, let the revolution begin. Um, there's so much focus on the Tungbuk's campaign, but then her, her, like her campaign and her, her activism is just being erased as like child children's play. I was wondering um, what are your thoughts on how the international audience or international organizations can shift discussions towards to give more attention to children agency and childhood agency? I think that's coming. This is obviously a very special young woman. She has privilege. She has a degree of affluence. She has enormous support. But she has also got analysis and commitment. And I think most of our children are capable of these kinds of things, given those kinds of goods. Not everybody's a leader. Thunberg is a leader. But I really think that she is showing us that the agency of someone like her recommends itself very highly for the truth she is telling and for the projects that she's initiating. And the people she's attracting are especially young people. So I don't know what what you're looking at, I mean, we could look at a lower franchise rate, but you know, I'm not keen on having somebody who never lifts their head off of Facebook vote for anyone. That would include most elders, too. But um, people that are engaged and committed and passionate, and knowledgeable, and other regarding are precisely those we want involved in public life. So, uh, I'm trying to think about some of the issues that you've been raising so eloquently from kind of community organizing perspective. Um, I think this kind of like really succinct critique of government policy and the fact that you know we can keep lobbying the southern state, but as you've articulated, so much so little has changed, right? From one one government regime to another, so much stays the same. So I'm wondering, outside of lobbying for policy change from the Canadian settler state, what kind of community organizing tactics you think? could get us towards a kind of more, like what you're describing is actually a reconciliatory approach, uh, as opposed to kind of window dressing we're seeing from Trudeau at all. And I think I've heard from, from you and also from many others the importance of land. And I'm curious uh, if, uh, as settlers, there's like a place to be doing that kind of like direct land repatriation outside of kind of government structures, or how you see that as fitting into a larger kind of movement or strategy. Well, first, wherever we go, we are on someone's territory. There was no terra nullius, no empty land. So once, once we suck up that truce, you know, wherever we go, if we're not on our home territory, we're on someone else's territory, it's good to be aware of that. It's good to know whose territory we're on. And it's good to think about where they are in relation to that territory. But I'm not advocating that you uh, turn your land deed over the nearest nation. Because while that would be very generous, I'm not sure it will change the structures and the processes, which is what I'm really concerned about. So I'd like to see government, which is the land expropriator and the facilitator of corporate predation, um, contain its power and transfer a portion of that power, a good chunk of that power, a really big chunk of it, to uh, indigenous nations reconstituted as nations. And here I am not thinking of banned governments or Métis locals. I'm thinking of nations with the political infrastructure and aspirations of a nation. Um, not, not a community organized under the Indian Act and ultimately responsible to the minister. Um, and at that point, then we can look for constitutional room and uh, procedural room to be made for things like taxation, revenue, and jurisdiction, and sovereignty, and some co-jurisdiction, because everybody's here to stay. We have to find a way to be together into the future. Um, but I think some return of the land is fundamental. 
and of the space to function on the land. And that means constitutional and economic and other kinds of space have to be vacated by these guys at the trough here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of our brother Jason Kenney, you know, who is, is absolutely convinced that Alberta belongs to Albertans, and he has forgotten that in his little threat to take Alberta private or national, um, that implicates all the indigenous people there who haven't been party to the conversation ever. So, so long as we can keep having the conversations and we can keep pushing the political order and we can keep having kitchen table discussions with our often thoroughly racist neighbors to get them to think about things. And that I have to commend to you because I have so little patience myself for that. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm a newcomer to Canada, and uh, I know very little about the Indigenous people of Canada, but it is quite clear to me from the horrific uh, uh, historical injustices that they have been going through for generations and centuries. Uh, my question uh, focuses on self determination, and uh, there's an ideal understanding of the concept of sovereignty, that there is only a one governor for the whole land. So when we talk about self-determination, as if, of course, somebody in my shoes, we talk very little, seems as if we're trying to uh, uh, have a sovereignty within a sovereignty. Uh, so how does uh, self-determination look to you in the future if, if we are trying to bring that to real life? And is there any other departments that Canada can learn from? New Zealand, Bolivia, Ecuador, of course, taking into consideration their particularities and the specialties of the Canadian complex of environment. Bolivia might not be a great example right now. <laughs> um, no, I, I would say in short, there are no good examples. There are different examples, but none of them are good. In terms of nested sovereignties, I would say that Canadian sovereignty has to be nested within Indigenous sovereignty, not the other way around. We were here first. We're the ones who, who have had the land taken. So we understand that the Canadian population isn't going to vanish. And I've said I'm not a subscriber to the boat argument, but I'm certainly a subscriber to the proposition that Indigenous self-determination is an a priori claim. And I don't believe that self-determination is fundamentally an individual human right. I think it is a right of collective community. On that, you will find people who disagree with me theoretically. So, well, no, I mean, they disagree with me really, but on the theory. So I don't know if that helps any. But in a case like this, where the original injury is the oppression and the theft, the remedy has to be a retreat from oppression, amends for it, and a return of the land. And then indigenous nations will be self-determining as they decide. So it's, a, it's a very diff uh, difficult uh, task to accomplish in order to this huge imbalance of power, right? The Canadian government and the indigenous people of Canada, right? This imbalance of power. So how can we bring that into life, right? Nesting this sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty within the sovereignty of the Canadian government. How can that happen? Is there any super powerful state or agent or group of people that willingly will go and share power with a group that's no. very fragile? And, and, and um, we're fragile, but we are not weak, or we wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, I guess my view is that, and somebody else confronted me with this. Uh, I gave a lecture in Edmonton a couple of weeks ago, and they said the same thing, sort of, you know, how are you going to compel this to happen? Well, I can't compel it. And that person said that there is no example in history of a powerful um, usurper handing back power. But many things in history haven't occurred before. Uh, or, or will occur in the future that didn't occur in the past. And I do believe that most Canadians are truly other regarding, that they are able to pick up the, the conceptual tools and the theoretical tools and see themselves in new situation. 
and I don't think indigenous governments could possibly be any more corrupt or less effective than Canadian governments. So if, if white Canadians and other Canadians found themselves living under indigenous governments and paying tax to them, it shouldn't be the end of the world. After all, you know, we've been stuck with that for the past 150 years and it's, you know, you manage, we're still here. I know it's an outside argument, but I'm going to make it. Well, here I am again. Um, I, I couldn't resist the uh, temptation of answering a question that was asked earlier, and that was, you know, how can activists in the broader community connect with, or, or what can they do about the land question? And I think uh, uh, one thing that I have seen work very effectively is develop a relationship. You know whose land this is. You know, you know whose land work is on, and Toronto is on. Um, what are you doing to make a relationship with the people who are the original, who are the original landowners here? Do you ever go to uh, anything that's done by the Mississaugas of the Credit? Do you ever go to the Native Canadian Center? Do you ever do anything? to develop the relationship. And I'm not talking about a relationship where you know you take your used clothing to uh, in and put it in, or some kind of quasi-charitable relationship where you you know take up take up a collection of skates and drop them off at a local arena for indigenous kids, but to uh, make friends the way you make friends with people, find out about them and uh, you know in it can happen at an institutional level, as I'm a senior fellow in residence at Mass College at U of T this year, and there is an office of the Mississaugas of the New Credit uh, at Massey, and we do activities together, we have events together, and Massey is taking a whole busload of people on a regular basis over to the Mississaugas of the Credit um, First Nation uh, to uh, just get to know people. So that's one thing. Get to know people. And another thing that, that um, lots of activists can do is join the demonstrations that are meant to um, defend the land. Uh, that happened as long ago as Clapham Sound. Uh, you know, when uh, people came from everywhere and marched behind, you know, the four foot ten grandmother, uh, the Aboriginal grandmother who was leading a whole bunch of people against the logging machines. And she was out there by herself, but there were so many people from the neighborhood around. Uh, the settlers, white people, uh, other people of color, just masses of people in solidarity. And that can be done, it's been done uh, in Ontario, the demonstrations against uranium um, uh, mining and testing and, and so on. Just go and, and join the demonstrations and show solidarity. So, you know, those those two things, make friends and show solidarity, they're things we can do on our own as well as in groups. Yeah, thank you for that, Mary. I believe I am testing your patience because the audience is evaporating. Thank you very much for coming. So please, uh, again, uh, join thanking uh, Dr. Green for her keynote today. And with that, thanks. We have a small gift uh, to thank you oh, for coming you. here today um, and spending and sharing your knowledge with us. So thank you. Thank you.